We're good? Okay. Well, let's turn our Bibles tonight, if you would please, to the book of First John. First John chapter 5. And I want to read verse 13 to get started tonight, and you could follow with me as I read that verse and as we go to different verses throughout the evening. We're at 1 John chapter 5, and we're at verse 13, where the Bible says, These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, for being so kind and gracious to us, for forgiving our sins and giving us the gift of eternal life by grace through faith in your Son, the Lord Jesus, who came and gave himself a ransom, paid for our sins and died and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And Father, tonight as we bring ourselves before you, we want to bring our prayers to you, our songs, our hymns to you, and Father, we bring our hearts and our minds and ourselves to you and ask that you might, by your Holy Spirit, open the lips of your servant to speak and open us to receive the Word of God, that you might do the work in us so that you can do a work through us. I pray you'd help us. I pray you'd challenge us, change us, convict us, comfort us, encourage us, and guide us and direct us so that we might go forth from this place, having said it was good to be in the house of the Lord. We thank you, we praise you, we give you all the glory for everything that you'll do. In Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle John was that disciple that leaned on Jesus' breast and indicated his close relationship with the Lord. John, more than most, understood the love of God and wrote on that subject of love more than any other of the Gospel writers. When his pen came to verse 13 of chapter 5, he declares the underlying reason that he wrote. And what particularly arrested my attention are four words in verse 13, and as he says he wrote these things, and these four words hit me, that ye may know. And indeed, is not that why the entire Bible was inspired of God and kept by his power unto this very day, that we may know? Didn't he also record the words of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 32, when he wrote, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. These things are written that you may know the truth. His fellow apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 14, 38, But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Now that word ignorant comes from the Greek word agoneo, and it means to know, to not know through lack of information or intelligence. It means to ignore. It means to not know. Now the word ignorant in the dictionary, the English dictionary, is an adjective. And it means, number one, lacking knowledge, information, or awareness about something in general or in particular. The second and informal meaning of ignorant is rude or discourteous. Now, it is the first meaning of this word that is found in the Greek and translated into our English word for ignorant in our text. In other words, he's saying here, uh, you know, the, if anybody wants to be ignorant, just let them be ignorant. If you, if you re, don't want to know, you refuse to know, you choose not to know, and you're going to not know because of a lack of information, then that's the way it's going to have to be. Paul is saying by inspiration of the Holy Spirit that if a person chooses to be ignorant, then let him be ignorant. If you want to live an ignorant life, then have at it. You have freedom to be ignorant. But then you have to live with the life that ignorance brings. The sad thing about such individuals is that they labor under misconceptions and fail to live life to the fullest, being burdened down by the products of their ignorance and hindered by its consequences. 
Ignorance brings chains of fear and superstition and anxiety and backwardness and childishness and foolishness. Amen. Truth, however, makes us free of such chains. As Bible-believing Christians, we should need, well, we should not need to be, or should we be, ignorant. Amen? Why? Because these things were written that we may know so that we wouldn't be ignorant. So let me share some areas of ignorance, ignorance that are recorded in the Bible. The first one is found in 2 Peter chapter 3. Just turn a little bit to your left. You'll find 2 Peter chapter 3. And my first ignorance that I find in the Word tonight is actually, number one, ignorance of the Word. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, there's that word knowing, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Verse 5, for this they willingly are what? Ignorant. Are ignorant of. That by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now there are a couple of things of which these individuals, these people, are considered uh, ignorant. Number one, it says in verse 5, they're ignorant of the creation. They're willingly ignorant, did you notice that, of the creation. The second thing is, they're ignorant of the worldwide flood, in verse 6. And the third thing they are ignorant of is worldwide incineration, verse 7. Look at all, also at verse 12, talking to Christians, we're looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That's worldwide incineration. And I want you to, want you to especially notice that these individuals, the individuals mentioned in verse 3, the scoffers, are willingly ignorant. They're, they're not just ignorant. It's not that they just don't know, it's that they are willingly ignorant. They don't want to know. Right. Now it's one thing if I do not know something because it's either unknowable or because I do not possess the means to know. But it is quite another when I refuse to know in light of the possibility of knowing. This word willing is ethelo, and it means to determine as an active voice option from subjective impulse. You said, what? <laughs> it means to choose, to prefer, to desire. In other words, the Bible is saying these are people, these scoffers are people who choose to be ignorant. They desire to be ignorant. They prefer to not know. And it's used adverbally sometimes with the idea of gladly. So here he's saying these scoffers in verse 3 are people who prefer and are glad and would rather choose to be not knowing than to know. That's pretty sad, isn't it? They could know and they should know but they don't want to know. They choose not to know. You know, there is a pity that can be extended to those who do not know because they did not have the information. There is a pity to be extended to those who do not know because they do not have the intelligence to understand the information that they do have. But there is a disdain for those who purposely choose not to know information that is readily available and have the intelligence to understand such information. So these scoffers in verse 3 then, they were people who were able to know 
and they had the information available, but they chose to ignore it and to be willingly ignorant, unknowing about these three things. The creation, the worldwide flood, and the worldwide incineration. These scoffers had opposed the truth of God's word because they, they didn't want to hear it. It's sort of like, don't, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Don't, don't tell me. Don't tell me. I don't want to be confused by the facts. And they're, they're not opposing it because they read it and studied it and disagree with it. They oppose it because they deliberately chose to ignore it. The Bible is an objective and immutable truth. That means that it does not pander. The Word of God does not pander to anyone or anything. It does not pander to the culture. It does not pander to the times. It does not pander to political persuasion. It does not pander to threat or intimidation. The Word of God is subjective truth that does not pander. And it's immutable, that means it never changes. Actually, truth can't change. See, the Bible says that God is truth, and God is immutable. God does not change. He can't change because He's truth. The Word of God is truth. It doesn't change. Now, men try to change it, right? Right? That's, we got all these different versions today and all these different perversions of the Bible. And that's just man trying to change the Word of God to be more suitable to him. But in reality, the truth of God's Word never changes. It's immutable. And so some people believe that truth. Others do not believe the truth. But these chose not to even know the truth. Those who are willingly ignorant of the truth will find the same eternal destruction as those who choose not to believe the truth they know. John said he wrote at the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we may know. So, is there, there's really, a uh, man is without excuse, isn't he? He's without excuse. Why? Because here's the Bible right here. And so there is this, this ignorance of the word. But then number two, I want you to go to Acts chapter 17, and I want you to see ignorant worship. There's ignorance of the word, and then there's ignorant worship. Acts chapter 17, look at verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye, what? Ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Now look with me at verse 19. And they took him, that's Paul, and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. Now Areopagus... It really is speaking of two things. It's speaking of a venerable council that had charge of religious, moral, and educational matters in Athens. They were the council. And this council met on the hill of Mars, which was west of the Acropolis. And Mars Hill was also known as the Areopagus. So he, in other words, the Areopagus would meet on Areopagus. Okay. The council of religious, moral, and educational matters of Athens would meet on Areopagus. And they would discuss, and they would philosophize, and they would, you know, hobnob and all that kind of stuff. Well, on his way to Mars Hill, because they were going to take Paul up there, they wanted to hear what Paul had to say. So on their way to Mars Hill, the Apostle Paul notices these shrines and idols and altars as he goes along, and they're all bearing the inscriptions of various gods and goddesses. And there was one that particularly brought attention uh, to his eyes, and that was an altar with the inscription on it to the unknown God. 
Now all the other idols and all the other shrines and altars all had names of gods on them. But this one said, to the unknown God, it's like they're trying to cover all their bases, right? Just in case there's a God out there somewhere that uh, we haven't thought of or we haven't got his name or her name, we just want to put this here so they don't, you know, that God doesn't get mad at us. That's pretty ignorant, isn't it? And he, char he charges the Athenians with ignorant worship. He said, here you are, you've got this shrine, this altar, it says to the unknown God, and so you're ignorantly worshiping him. You don't even know who he is. And so you worship him without knowledge, you worship him without understanding, you worship him ignorantly. You see, this unknown God was unknown to the Athenians not because he was unknowable but because they chose not to know him. All right? The God that they did not know was actually the only true and living God. And so here they got all these shrines and altars and idols, they got all these names of all these gods on them, and they don't even know the name of the only one that's really true. The only one that's really living. Now they know the names of all the other ones. But they don't know the name of this one. Not because he's not unknowable. Because they didn't want to know. How can I say that they chose not to know him? How could I say that? Well, turn with me to Psalm number 19. Psalm number 19. Look at verse 1. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. And so what, what's the psalmist saying? David is saying this. He's saying, listen, the true and living God can be known just by looking into his creation. He screams through his creation. He, it says their words are gone out to all the ends of the earth. God speaks to his creatures about himself and manifests his qualities and powers and attributes through the creation all around us. And so if we can look at creation and not know the true and living God, it's because we choose not to. When we can look at all around us and say, I'm going to worship a stump or I'm going to worship a rock, that's because we choose not to know the truth that is set before our eyes every single day of our lives. You know, I told you this morning, I went to the eye doctor and I saw that picture of the eyeball up on that chart. That was incredible. I've been to uh, other doctors and I've seen uh, the ear. I've looked at a, a chart of the ear and all the intricacies of the human ear. And I was one time looking in a doctor's office at the, at the ankle and the foot and I looked at all the intricacies of the ankle and I look at this stuff and it just blows my mind how minute the details are. Everything's just perfect. And I thought for a doctor, for a physician to look at that chart and to see the interest of that eyeball or that ear and not to know that God did that, they have to be willingly ignorant. To rather say, well, all this intricacy evolved. I mean, that doesn't even make sense. And to do that, you have to be willingly ignorant of the God who's displaying himself and saying, look at this. Hey, and look at this. Hey, and look over here. Look at this. Did you ever see anything like this? No, you never did because I made it. And I'm the only one that can make it. Go with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Look with me at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. 
Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God says, listen, I have put within you a knowledge of me, and then I put all around you a knowledge of me. You can even know my Godhead and my power, but you choose not to. That's willful ignorance. And it even says in verse 21, because that when they knew God, see, they glorified him not as God. This worship ignorance is really a result of word ignorance, isn't it? You see, here I have the word of God. God, and if I am to worship the true and living God, I, I, I find him in here. You want to see God? Get in his word. You want to know what God's like? Read the Bible. You want to see what God can do? Read the Bible. You want to see God's attributes and characteristics and qualities and His essence? Read the Bible. If I'm ignorant of this book, I'll be ignorant of God. So if I willingly choose to disregard the Bible, if I willingly choose not to read the Bible, then I'm going to be automatically involved in ignorant worship. Their, their worship was ignorant. Why? Because they didn't know God. Why didn't they know God? They choose not to know God. So if we don't know God, our worship is ignorant. Many today, all around the world, worship God ignorantly. Refusing to see Him for who and what and as He is, and instead clinging to superstitions and religions and philosophies and gods made in their own images. They refuse to know the true and living God and instead feed themselves spiritually on the maggots of false gods. I believe that even among Christianity, there are those who do not want to know the truth in its fullness and choose to worship God in the ignorance of fleshly and worldly worship, being willingly ignorant of the word of God. There are Christians all around our country, they don't know the Bible. They can't quote verses. They don't know what the Word of God says on different subjects or what the Word of God says about Christian living. They desperately try to pass off as worship that which pleases themselves rather than that which pleases and glorifies God. See, the heathen are guilty of making God after their own image. But sometimes we as Christians are guilty of worshiping God after our own pleasures, according to our own devices. We want the worship the way we want it to be, more than the way God wants it to be. Just like the heathens say, we want a God the way we want a God to be. We don't want God to be the way he really is. So sometimes Christians say, you know what? I don't want to worship God according to the word of God. I just want to worship God to the way I feel, to the way my, my culture is, to the way... Hmm? Three times the Bible says, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And yet we see a dire lack of holiness among Christians even in their worship in 21st century America. So if, I don't, if, I don't, if I'm ignorant of worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, then I won't be worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. If the Bible says I'm supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth, but I wonder if really all the worship that is brought to God today under the guise of Christianity is really in truth or in spirit. There can be an an ignorance of worship that is a result of an ignorance of the word. And an ignorance of the word can bring us to part number three, ignorant walk. An ignorant walk. There are those who are true born again believers yet walk in ignorance of the word of God. 
their lifestyles are incompatible with Scripture, whether because they do not know or maybe it's because they do not wish to know. Only God knows that. But no one need be ignorant of the walk of the believer that pleases God because he outlines it in the word which he has written. So God has given us his word. Now, when he was working with Israel, remember working with Israel? How did Israel know how to worship God and how to live for God? How did they know? He gave them the Old Testament. He wrote the word for them. And he outlined a whole lot of stuff, right? Now we come to the New Testament. And now we're New Testament believers. We're born again. We're in Christ. How are we going to know how to live our lives? And how are we going to know how to worship God in the New Testament era? By reading the New Testament. By reading God's Word. His instructions to us, right? I wonder if we went to Christians at any given point, in any given day, and said to them, did you read your Bible today? Did you read your Bible today? Hey, have you read your Bible today? I wonder how many would have to say no. I, I, didn't get, I didn't get around to it. I didn't have time. I wanted to, but I was in a hurry. All right, so those all might be true. Those are, those are all good excuses. If you need an excuse, any excuse, pull one out. It'll work. But the truth of the matter is, if we're not going to read the Word of God, how are we going to walk in the way of God? If we don't know what God expects or what God wants, how are we going to do what God expects or what God wants? No one need be ignorant of the walk because God's given us the Bible. God's Bible is an instruction manual for life and eternal life. Now, there is a way that God wants his children to walk. In 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says, Keep the charges of the Lord thy God to walk in His ways. So if there are ways that are His, then there must be ways that are not His. Or why would He tell us to walk in His ways if there weren't ways that were contrary to His ways? And then in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, Listen to what the Bible says. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, here it is, this is the way, walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left. So God's saying, you know what? I've got a straight and narrow path I want you to walk on. He, you know what he's saying to modern day Christians? He's saying, look, you, you, just can't, you, know, you just can't meander all around through life. He said, I've got a way, I've got a path, I've got a, 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 a way. And he said, when you start to turn to the left, or you start to turn to the right, the Holy Spirit will say to you, hey, you're, going, you're off the path here. Hey, you're straying a little bit. Hey, get, turn left, turn right. God will guide us. We're being supposed to be led of the Spirit. In the New Testament, we read about the the way of the Lord and the way of God. And even Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 17, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance, here it is, of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So Paul's saying, you know what, I sent Timothy along. He's going to remind you of of my ways which be in Christ. See? He said, I'm teaching, I'm teaching my ways, which are in Christ. I'm teaching them in every church I go to. Paul said, I give the same message to every church. This is the way, walk in it. Over here to Ephesus. He goes to Galatia. This is the way, walk in it. He goes to Thessalonica. This is the way, walk in it. He goes over to Rome. This is the way, walk in it. He goes to Colossae. This is the way, walk in it. Now he sent Timothy to come behind him and say, remember, Paul said, this is the way, walk in it. Paul said, this is the way, walk in it. Paul said, this is the way, walk in it. Are you walking in it? That hasn't changed. The way we're supposed to walk in hasn't changed just because it's the 21st century. It hasn't evolved. God's way doesn't evolve. It's his way. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There's a way which seemeth right unto a man. (laughs) But the end thereof are the ways of death. And so it doesn't matter what seems right to you. 
but what God's Word says is right. Amen. You know, people say, well, you know, it just, it just feels right to me. Seems right to me. Yeah, but is it compatible with the Bible? Does it agree Amen. with the Word of God? If it doesn't agree with the Word, it doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter how it seems right. to you. If God says it's right, it's right. If God says it's wrong, it's wrong. He's not asking your opinion. He doesn't ask how you feel about it. He doesn't say, well, you know, what seems right to you? What you have then is every man doing what's right in his what? In his own eyes. You've got chaos. You have anarchy. There's an ignorant walk. It's a walk that does not know... And we cannot, and for some people it might genuinely be because they don't have the information. But for most people it's because they don't care to know. Now, there are a few areas that God did not want us to be ignorant about. And so he specifically inspired Paul to write about them. And Peter. I'm just going to go through them for you. We're only going to go to a couple of verses to look at them because we'll be here all night if I, went, if I took you to everyone. But here's the first one. God didn't want us to be ignorant about hindrances. In Romans chapter 1, 13, chapter 1, verse 13, he says, Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Paul saying, you know what, Romans, I, I, it's been on my heart to come down there. I mean, I wanted to come to Rome. I purposed in my heart to get there, but something just keep hindering me. I'd like to come down and have the same fruit among you that I've had among other Gentiles, but I just keep getting hindered. Now, sometimes, now he wanted them to know, they didn't want them to be ignorant. Now, sometimes we're hindered in our way by God. Sometimes there's a way that seems right unto a man, but it's not the way God wants us to go. Sometimes we want to do something, but it's not really what God wants us to do. And I can back that up with Acts chapter 16, verse 6, when Paul says, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. So here's the, here's the apostle, he wants to go over to Asia. He said, look, those people went over to Asia, they need the word of God, let's go preach over there. And the Holy Spirit hindered them. Holy Spirit said no. Now look, our human brain would say, what, 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 that doesn't even make sense. I mean, why wouldn't God want, the, you ever hear this? Why wouldn't God want the people of Asia to hear? I don't know. But if he said no, he said no. You think he has a good reason for it? You think God might see something we don't see, know something we might not know? You think God might say that it's just not the right time yet, so it's good over here, I'm going to take you over here? You think maybe God said, you know what, I want you to go to Macedonia, they're ready, but Asia isn't ready. Now you go over to Macedonia and I'll be working over here in Asia and I'll be getting Asia ready. And when it's ready, I'll let you go. But right now, I'm going to keep you from going there and I'm going to send you to Macedonia. But sometimes we're hindered in our way by Satan. 1 Thessalonians 2.18, wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. So sometimes the old devil doesn't want you to do what God wants you to do, and he'll, he'll work at hindering you. And Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. Okay? I want, are these things have I written that you may what? No. That you may know. Okay, second thing he says he doesn't want us to be ignorant about is God's righteousness. Romans 10, 13. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. He said, I want you to know something. There's God's righteousness, there's your righteousness. God's righteousness is perfect and pure. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. And he said, you've got to understand, you can't be going around trying to establish your own righteousness because you don't have any. You should be establishing God's righteousness. God gets to say what's righteous and what's unrighteous, what's good and what's bad, what's true and what's false, not us. Third thing. In Romans eleven twenty five, 25, he doesn't want us to be ignorant of the mystery of Israel. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness is in part happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, be come in. So he's saying, listen, right now, it seems like God has forsaken Israel, it seems like God has left Israel, but I don't want you to be ignorant about this, that it's only for a season while he reaches out to the Gentiles. 
God is not done with Israel yet. God still is still the apple of his eye. They're still the children of God. They are his nation. And he has not cast them off. He's just put them on hold, so to speak, while he goes over to the Gentiles and gets a, a, a church out of the Gentiles. But he's going back and will deal with Israel as the apple of his eye. Yeah, I don't want you to be ignorant about that. See, we can get pretty uppity about it, couldn't we? We can say, well, you know, God doesn't care about Israel anymore. We're it. He said, wait a minute, you're grafted in. Never forget you're grafted in. They weren't grafted in, but you were grafted in, so don't get uppity. You know, it really bothers me when I hear Christians that do not like Israel. That do not pray for Israel. When Christians are derogatory toward Jewish people or Israel, that's not good. So called. Huh? So called Christians. Yeah, well, yeah. What are they? They're ignorant. All right, let's go on to the next one. Number four, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul didn't want us to be ignorant of the spiritual rock. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat. Look at this. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them. And that rock, capital R, was who? Jesus. Was Christ. Do you see who the rock is? Who's the rock? It's right there in the Bible. When Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church, there's only one rock. And the Bible clearly says that rock is Christ. But Paul's saying, I don't want you Corinthian believers to be ignorant of this, that the rock in the wilderness was Jesus Christ. There's not one God of the Old Testament and another God of the New Testament. There's not two different gods. There's not, you know, there's one God. Jesus is God. He is that rock that followed them. And listen, if you read your Bible, you'll find out a rock followed them. I believe with all my heart there was a rock that actually traveled with Israel wherever they went. They turn around, there's that rock. They turn around, there's that rock. And who was that rock? Christ. Now, he wasn't the physical rock. The rock was a, it was a picture of the Christ who followed them and went with them and provided their needs. And he said, I don't want you to be ignorant about that. The same Christ that supplies your needs, the same Christ that supplied Israel's needs. The, same, the, the Christ that protects you is the same Christ that protects them. He is the Christ of the Gentiles. He's the Christ of the Jews. There's only one Christ. There's only one Savior. And there he is in the Old Testament, and here he is in the New Testament. He's called the rock in the New Testament, he's called the rock of the Old Testament. He is the only rock. Number five, he didn't want us to be uh, ignorant of spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Seems to me that there's a lot of ignorance among God's people concerning spiritual gifts. And some of this ignorance is willful ignorance. When, 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 when a woman preacher says, I, I know what the Bible says, but, that's willful ignorance. It doesn't matter what you think, it matters what the Bible says. The same thing is true of spiritual gifts today. When Paul says they'll cease, when Paul says they'll pass away, they ceased and they passed away. But there's willing ignorance. We want those gifts, so we're going to have them, whether they're biblical or not. We want those gifts for today, so we're going to exercise them, whether it's in the flesh or not. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. See, what he did, he wrote it in a book. Number six, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, something else he doesn't want us to be ignorant about. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 8. He doesn't want us to be 
ignorant of troubles. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia. Now here's what he's saying. You know, you ever, you know, people think sometimes because you're a Christian, everything's going to be peachy and rosy and smooth and aren't going to be troubles. Paul's saying, I don't want you to be ignorant about our troubles. We got troubles, Paul's saying. Paul said, I'm an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, but I got problems. I got troubles. You got, pro- you got problems and troubles? Sure you do. So did Paul. Look, as a matter of fact, look what Paul said here. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came unto us in Asia. Here it is, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we depart, despaired even of life. Paul said, we were ready to give up, man. We thought we were going to die. We didn't know what to do. He even says in verse 9, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves. We couldn't trust ourselves. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Now look at verse 11. Who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver. Paul says, look, you got problems, I got problems. God delivered me from my problems, he'll deliver you from your problems. He delivered me from them in the past, he's delivering me in the present. And when I get in troubles in the future, he'll deliver me there too. He said, we were almost ready to throw in the towel, we were ready to give up, we thought we were going to die, but God came through. I don't want you to be ignorant now. I don't want you to think you're the only one that got troubles. I don't want you to think you're the only one that despairs of life. I don't want you to think you're the only one that goes through these things. That we went through it too, but God delivered us and God will deliver you. He said, I want you to be ignorant about troubles. They're, they're part of life. Even for Christians. Even for good Christians. Even for serious, dedicated Christians. Number seven. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Just go over a page or so. We're not supposed to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Look what he says. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. These things are written that you may what? That you may know. That we may know the devices of Satan. And Paul is saying, you know what? We're not ignorant of his devices. Why? Because God told us about them in the Word. God told us what the devil is like. God tells us what the devil does. God tells us how he operates. And we shouldn't be ignorant of it. We don't have to be ignorant of it. We know he's a liar. We know he's a murderer. We know there's no truth in him. We know he's a deceiver. Those were his tactics. Number eight, he doesn't want us to be ignorant about Christians who have died. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. He said, look, all the Christians from here to the time I write this, all the way up, Till Jesus comes, they're not going to be ignorant about what happens when a Christian dies. He said, you don't have to be ignorant. You ever watch those people on the news when somebody in some of these countries die? I mean, they go berserk. They go ballistic. Yeah. You know, they're, they're like yeah. crazy. Why? Because they have no hope. They really have no hope. You know what the, you know what the one thing about Christianity is that speaks to the heart of Muslims and Hindus and others around the world is the love of God. Muslims don't have love of God in their religion. There's no love of God. And when they hear about a God of love, it kind of like, kind of like blows them away. They don't have any hope. See, we know what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen when a Christian dies. We know where the Christian goes. We know what's going to happen to the Christian's body sooner or later. We know what's going to happen in the after. We know all this stuff so that we sorrow, but not as they who have no hope. He said, I want you to be ignorant about the resurrection. And then the last one is, he didn't want us to be ignorant about time. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. He said, I don't want you to get, I want you to be ignorant about God's timetables. He said, you got to understand, God doesn't look at time the way we do. God is above and beyond all time. God controls time. God created time. Before God created time, there was no time. And after this old world, we have a new heaven and a new earth, there won't be any time anymore. Do you understand that? There's no watches or clocks in heaven. 
There's no calendars. There's like no appointments. Amen? Yes. Amen. I think it's going to be awesome. Amen. Time without end. What do you care what time it is? Yeah. <laughs> right? Oh. A thousand years is as a day. So people, he's saying, Christians, I don't want you to be ignorant. You don't have to get discouraged. You don't have to start worrying. You don't have to be afraid that Jesus isn't coming because it's been 2,000 years. He said, it's like two days. See? He says, time with God is different than time is with us. I don't want you to be ignorant about that. Why? Because there were those who were saying, where is the promise of his coming? Where is the promise of his coming? Where is the promise of his coming? You know what? It's coming. Amen. The promise of his coming is coming. Right. Well, when's it going to be? It's been 2,000 years. So what? What if it's 10,000 years? So what? A day is as 1,000 years, and 1,000 years is one day. With the Lord. Now, why did John say that all these things were written? That we may know. Isn't that exciting? Yes, it is. That we may know. I mean, we can know this stuff. There are, you know, philosophers and people that have PhDs and they sit around and they contemplate and they meditate and they frustrate each other trying to come up with these great theories and philosophies about how, whoa. God said, I already wrote it down. You already know. You guys get to know it. He said, I've written to you that you can know these things. Awesome. We know where we came from. We know why we're here. And we know where we're going. Awesome. That's exciting, isn't it? Awesome. We know what God's like. We know what God wants. We know what God has for us. We know what God will do for us. We know. Why? Because he wrote it. Yeah. And when we know the truth, what does it do? Makes it makes us free. We do not have to worship ignorantly. And we do not have to walk ignorantly if we're not ignorant of God's word. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Time for a few questions that we need to ask ourselves. And I say to you tonight, dear Christians, some of what is called worship today is nothing more than the product of an ignorance of God's person and God's character and God's holiness as outlined in the scripture. And many today are not walking in the way of the Lord as they should, but in their own ways because of being ignorant of God's word. Determine not to be ignorant. Read God's word. And remember that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Jeremiah said this in his day. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way, and walk therein? And you shall find rest for your souls. You see, God said, you know what? There's some old ways. And those are the good ways. And those are the ways I want you to walk in. Those are the ways I want you to stand in. But you know what the very next, verse, the very next words are in this verse? But they said, we will not walk therein. And dear Christian, I'm afraid we're a time in the history of Christianity where Christians are saying, we will not walk therein. We don't want the old paths. We don't want the old ways. We want the new. We want the jazzy. We want the exciting. We want this. We want that. And God said, that's not where you're going to find rest for your souls. Don't be that guy. And if you're here tonight and you've never been saved, you're watching or listening, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Don't be ignorant about salvation. Salvation is not of works, it's not of man, it is of God and it's by faith. Salvation is Jesus and comes to you by believing him and calling upon him as Savior. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can be willingly ignorant all the way to hell. Or you can know the truth and be made free. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. My dear friend, you have to trust Christ as your Savior, or you will be eternally lost, and you'll be ignorant all the way to hell. Before it's too late, 
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you for writing these things that we may know. And Lord, really the only way we know these things is because you've written them. If you had not written this book, we would have never discovered these truths. These would never have become to us. We would not know them. We can know what you're like. We can see you in your creation. But all these things we heard about tonight that we're not supposed to be ignorant of, we would still be ignorant of. But you wrote these things that we may know. And knowing, we may be free. Help us, my Father, to walk in your ways because we know your word and we'll worship you in spirit and in truth and in the spirit of holiness. I pray you'd bless our invitation, my Lord. Whatever it is that you've put on people's hearts, let them come, let them pray. Let them just spend a moment with you to praise you and thank you or whatever they might need to do. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing number 238, I Must Tell Jesus. You must tell Jesus. You know what? Because nobody else can really do anything for you like he can. Maybe you need to come tonight and tell him something. Maybe you need to come tonight and tell him you love him. Maybe you need to come tonight and say, tell him, thank you for writing these things so I could know what I know. Maybe you need to come tonight and say, I'm just so glad I know what I know. It's awesome to know what I know. You didn't know it before you were saved, but you know it now. Why? Because of his word. Maybe you might want to come and say, Lord, I want to stay in the old paths, wherein is the right way and the good way. I don't want to be part of that crowd that says we will not walk therein. Oh, that's old fashioned. That's, 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 that's not for today. Well, it's for God. Isn't that what counts? All right, we're going to sing. You do what God wants you to do. If you need to be saved or have questions about salvation, please come and see me. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver. Make of my troubles quickly and end. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Who do you run to first? With your troubles, your needs, your heartaches, your fears, your disappointments? Is it Jesus? Sometimes I'm afraid he's our last resort instead of our first resort. I understand we want people to pray for us, but who are we looking to? Jesus? Let's tell him. Let's let him do what he can do as we sing on the third. Tempted and tried, I need a great Savior. One who can help my burdens to bear. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. He all my cares and sorrows will share. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus.
trust of Jesus. Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, and he will help me. Over the world, the victory to win. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Rod Hart, would you come and close us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, for the facts of the, the scripture. Lord, we pray, Father, tonight that you will help us this week to not be ignorant. Help us, Lord, to follow your word. Help us to reach out to souls. Help us to be the kind of servants, Lord, that would honor you and glorify your name. And we do pray that you would guide and direct this week. You would be with each of us. And if there's one in our path that does not know Christ, that you'll help us to reach them for you. And all we do pray now you would bless in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I have an announcement. Tonight we're going to have the Lord's Table. If you're here tonight and you're born again and you'd like to stay and participate in the Lord's Table, free, feel free to do so. We'll take a few moments to get ready. <laughs>